Greetings friends, it's your guy NWB and welcome back to Toronto Talk Sports and More. Today I am joined by Melissa Amor. Hi guys. Also joining us is a, a goalkeeper. A goalkeeper that plays Liverpool in England and also represents Canada. She is the last line of defence for both sides and her name is Riley Foster. Riley, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you guys? I'm good, Riley. Nice. nice of you to join us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on. Now, Riley, you're back in the UK at the moment. If I'm not mistaken, you just returned from Canada. So are you in isolation at the moment, the 14 days isolation? I just finished my isolation today, luckily. Um, yeah, but I came back. I had to isolate for two whole weeks. Couldn't go outside. Had to get everything delivered to me, but happy days that I'm out now. <laughs> How has life been for you in quarantine then? Like, what have you been up to? Oh, um, I've just been working out, honestly. Like, for the first bit, I feel like I've been isolating this whole time because when it happened, like, Corona first started, we had to be in complete lockdown. We couldn't really go outside. Couldn't go to the shops much. So I was here for two and a half months, and then I had to isolate when I went home for two weeks again. And then after a week and a half of being home without isolation, I came back here and had to isolate again. So all I do is just work out. I cook. I read. Um, just hang out. I feel like I've gotten like really good at watching Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can really do. <laughs> nice one. And Riley, you moved to Liverpool this year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Do you have a support network or some, some family around you? Yeah. So fortunately, my dad's side of the family is from Liverpool specifically. Um, his, I want to say like second, maybe third cousin, um, lives in Warrington, which is like a 45 minute drive away from me. And then um, I also have some closer family, like my agent and stuff is actually related to me as well. So nice. um, that's kind of like my little niche. But other than that, I don't really know anyone else. I was very fortunate when I was with the national team, my um, head coach for my youth team, um, she actually is back here with the England national team, the senior squad. So I have that connection if I want to go see her, say hi, go for coffee or whatever it may be. But other than that, it's pretty little. Okay. So you were at like West Virginia University, right? Playing for yeah. the Mountaineers. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Um, it was really unique. I think it's any time you get to go to the States and play in a different country, um, different cultures and stuff, just to um, enjoy that is, is fun. But specifically with West Virginia, it's, um, it's a state with no professional sports, um, very lowly ranked on all statistics possible, whether it be obesity, um, education and all that kind of stuff. So being able to play in a state where the fans literally are only from there and they encircle the entire school. It's really cool. Um, being their only professional team as well. Everyone's kind of there. Diehard fans are all literally in the hospital parking lot is gutted before a football match and there's RVs everywhere. Um, right. our games, like the fans, the younger kids, it's just, it's more than just inspiring people, but it's, it's more of a, a fact that you're kind of, putting forth this like momentum of bringing athletics to a state that needs it most. Um, right. And also just giving something for these young kids and especially little girls to look up to. It's very Southern mentality in a sense and blue collared. Um, so not many opportunities are presented to these like, younger kids. And now to be able to have like a successful soccer program there um, in sports in general, at the D1 school has very like, it's kickstarted everything into the state and kind of brought more funding in and more opportunities for all these kids. Right. Nice. Now, on the point of kids, you're, you're playing football at, at one, the highest level. You're, you're playing professionally for a, a huge club at Liverpool. You're representing your country, Canada. What, sort of, what is some advice you can pass on to some younger kids that want to follow in your footsteps, particularly young girls? Hmm. I think being from Canada specifically in a sport that has, is still developing, um, the opportunities are still growing for the women's side. Um, I think it's just this, my biggest thing I'd probably say is stay in the now. Um, and in that sense, I kind of mean not just focus on what's going on right in front of you, but more in a sense of keep going forward, keep striving, take every opportunity that you get because you never know when your next opportunity is going to be. Um, but also not to let the, the background noise get in the way. Like uh, for me growing up personally, it's always, oh, how are you going to play professional soccer? There's no opportunities for women. They don't make much money. Um, you're never going to get endorsement deals and all that kind of stuff. Whereas when I blocked that out and I said, well, I don't care. I just want to do what I love. I want to, I want to have fun with the game. I want to take it to the furthest level. I want to inspire the next generations and 
I think that's what helped me. It's just focusing on what's in front of me rather than everything else that's around me. Right. So what's your favorite moment so far? I know you're young. You're still young. What's your favorite moment in your like soccer career as of now? Hmm. There's so many. I think my highlight of my career right now is obviously signing for Liverpool as it's my childhood dream. Um, right. My favorite club. Congratulations um, on that too. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, it's honestly my favorite place to be. I've always wanted to be here. Um, but besides that, I'd say I got the opportunity to be a part of the Canada U20 World Cup squad. Um, I was actually hosted in Toronto, Edmonton, and Quebec. And that opportunity to just kind of be the first World Cup since 2002 in Canada. And after the Olympics happened and after we won bronze in 2020, uh, 2012, um, to have all those fans, and I didn't even get to play any game there. I was on the bench, but that opportunity just to be connected with the Canadian fans and be on home soil um, and experience all that was just like exhilarating. I can't even like express the feeling of like, when we won in a tight match, I think it was in Finland or something like that, and the, like, we were losing and we came back in this massive comeback game and then celebrating with everyone around the stadium. Um, people from my hometown were there. Um, just like, how are you feeling? Well, how was that rush, though? Did you get a, you get a just, rush out of that? Yeah, like, I can't even explain it enough. It's just like when you're in the moment, it's like, oh, yeah, this is cool. But when you're on the sidelines and you're seeing, you're hearing the fans rally again like, with you, and then we had an African nation who also, like their fans are cheering with our fans. So the music and all the, the drums and stuff are going. It was just yes. so cool. Yeah. Um, but to win and advance into the quarterfinals on home soil is just kind of like breathtaking. I can't even explain it enough how like, amazing. And that kind of inspired me to keep on going and keep on inspiring these next generations um, and working hard because not many opportunities come across where you get to play on home soil in a World Cup. So to have that opportunity again, I just keep on striving for that. Right. Beautiful. Good. Speaking of home soil, I'm Australian. Uh, <laughs> I was born and raised in Australia. And the next Women's World Cup is in Australia and New Zealand in 2023. Yeah. How excited are you for this, for potentially being a part of that with Team Canada in three years' time? I think it's an awesome opportunity for Australia and New Zealand. I think both of those teams in those countries have so much talent. Um, and I've watched a lot of the Australian games and how their fans have started to come around their team. And I think with legends like Sam Kerr with Australia, um, she's just done so well with promoting the game for the country. And for them to now have kind of like the whole world behind them and everyone coming there for, I feel like Australia gets a lot of tourist, tourist attraction, but not much for sports. And I think this is a really big opportunity, not only for that mindset, but also for the generations to come. And I think that's one of the biggest highlights with all World Cups is to kind of inspire the next generation. And with New Zealand and Australia both having that opportunity, I think it's going to be a great, great thing for them. Um, it's going to bring a lot of uh, football attraction to the, the country. And I think that's what's needed. Just get those youth moving and to get them behind the country, get them to support everything, experience like that feeling that I got to have um, in Canada. And just as a fan, um, seeing when the, the Women's uh, World Cup came, and being a fan of those stands, that feeling of just pride and everything. And I'm so happy that they get to experience it. Um, but also, it's a beautiful country. And if I can just keep on working to that, I would love to go back to Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> right. So you've been there before? Uh, yeah, we've done some tours in Australia in the 20s. Before uh, Papua New Guinea World Cup, uh, we went there. And that was really fun. I loved it. And then we went back, or we were there earlier in the year as well to prepare for the, the climate and stuff beautiful i absolutely loved it the ocean everything about it is just amazing nice yeah. so what words of advice would you have uh, to pass on to some young soccer players out there to inspire them to play the game um i think just be brave be bold um the game is very unique it's not just your typical gymnastics or dance it's very out of the it's against the grain i think that's what i'd say and it's considered more masculine sport but to just become passionate about something and put yourself into something is not always easy. And I think just taking the risk and being brave um, and challenging yourself every day, I think you're going to explore so many new things and new talents that you have within yourself um, that you may not have noticed. And maybe it might be playing with the boys in the schoolyard or whatever it may be, or just enrolling in the, the young development ages, having fun with it. Don't really take it too seriously at first because you never know what's going to happen at the end of the day. I think for me, my parents put me in soccer just so I could burn energy. And if that's your form of way to burn energy, um, you might actually have a storyline like mine. And I think that's one of the best things you can do. But be brave, be bold. Don't be afraid to go against the grain. Nice. 
<laughs> That's an interesting point you raised because uh, you mentioned that your, your father was from Liverpool and you, you grew up in Ontario. Were there any other sports that you considered playing or you, was your heart always set on playing um, football, soccer? Um, my dad really tried to get me in hockey. Not the <laughs> hockey. I, so Canadian. <laughs> it's not because I feel like my family's like you're pretty stereotypical Canadian. Like we go up north all the time. We're always like just doing the typical Canadian stuff. One in the markets, always in Toronto. You know what I mean? Yeah. But me in, in hockey just we didn't match very well. I couldn't stop on the ice in my skates. I didn't get the offside rules, and it's surprising because soccer is pretty similar in a sense. But I just it just wasn't working for me. Um, and I was also a gymnast. I was an elite gymnast at a young age. I decided to pursue my soccer career at a young age, but um, I was traveling provincially and had some national opportunities at that level as well. So have you ever like tried to use any of your gymnastic moves on the field? Like, you know, any switch leaps, any flips? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could celebrate like Sam Curtis when she does her, yes. her back flip, but yeah. I'm pretty sure I would break a bone in my body now. Like I'm not that flexible anymore. I don't even think I can jump that high I just feel like I can flip on a trampoline anymore <laughs> <laughs> flexibility is important especially for a goalkeeper what mm -hmm. what are some things that you do post-match or during the week before a game to I guess improve your flexibility um I'm really big into yoga I love it I think it's just great for the body and the mind um I'm a big like I guess you can say spiritual in a sense where I'm, I'm very like into all that kind of stuff so during the week I probably do at least two yoga sessions and one of them is probably more like a, a workout in a sense, but if it's getting closer to game day, it's more like a flow, get the body moving, get a stretch out of it. Um, that's one of the big things, but also in the gym, when I'm weightlifting and stuff, challenging myself and pushing my body in different ways. Um, like when it comes to weightlifting, whether it's my squats, I'm kind of pushing my depth and working the like ankle range of motion and stuff. Um, whether it's bench press and stuff, working my shoulder motion and all that kind of stuff. So I'm always just challenging myself and pushing myself in different ways. I feel like flexibility comes in different forms of stretching. Um, you gotta be flexible, obviously in your body and physicality, but also in your mind. And I think that's when you challenge yourself and like the yogas and stuff, that's when you're gonna see more improvement. Okay. So what gets you hyped up before the game? Like what song or artist do you listen to that revs you up and it's like you walk into that stadium and you're like focused? Like what are you listening to when you walk in? Um, I used to have this playlist when I went to my first World Cup qualifiers in Jamaica. And it's got like the oldest music on it. Um, like, I guess older for me, but like uh, there's like a lot of, I listen to a lot of rock in a sense. Um, yes. A lot of hip hop as well. I think Drake's trophies always kind of gets me hyped up. Before. You're right. <laughs> You're like, good oh, choice, yeah. good choice. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's also a talk in the championship mindset. And it kind of just walks you through as if you're walking through a tunnel. Yeah. And every right. time I exit the bus or like wherever I'm going into like the locker room, I listen to that. And it's like, just kind of like hones you in on what you're expected to come, like the challenges and everything like that. And then obviously, um, I'm going to get to the locker room for the first five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe. I'm listening to my own stuff. Um, I kind of do like a little meditation along with that. Um, I guess it's a podcast in a sense. Um, and then the team's obviously playing music. So after I'm done my little rituals and stuff, I will join in in their little festivities, singing, dancing. Not so dancing. Who, has the be who has the best and the worst singing voice on your team? Rinsola, <laughs> I've heard, has a really good um, singing voice. I've never heard it myself, but she's my roommate soon. So I'm actually excited to hear her sing. Um, I think I probably had the worst singing voice. I'll just put myself out there and just burn myself <laughs> out. I cannot depend on it. I'm sure you probably have, the people that usually say that probably usually have the better voices. <sighs> you sure you don't want to drop a bar or two? Just no. Like I'm going to save you guys all the pain. I'm going to save your tears from bleeding. You don't, don't want to sing. You no. don't sing. You'll never walk alone. Sing a little something. Let's hear you. <laughs> yeah, I'm oh, so no. bad. Uh, anyway, yeah. I'll stop singing. You sound better than me, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to sing in the choir in high school. Another story. <laughs> anyway, um, I have a question. What's been your biggest struggle in your career so far? Mm, I think the it's a really good question. You've had to face? Um, I've had a few. I think when we talk about athletes in general, there's so many different perspectives and obstacles we face. I think one of the biggest ones you talk about is mental um as a goalkeeper pressure is a privilege i think um being able to deal with it in a proper way in a professional way is very challenging and i think i've kind of dabbled with 
professionalism versus immaturity um, throughout my career. And I think now I'm trying to learn that like, okay, my opportunities will come and the pressure that I'm under is it's okay. Like it's a privilege in a sense. You have like the stage to perform on. Um, you're expected to do well every day, but you've trained all your life for this. And it's okay if you make a mistake, like having to understand that um, and accept it is probably one of the biggest challenges. I'm very hard on myself. I'm like, a, I'm an analytical freak when it comes to this stuff. I get hard on myself when I make a mistake. Um, I have a hard time letting things go or I'll watch film until my eyes bleed basically. But um, being able to just accept losses, accept mistakes was one of my biggest obstacles. But on a physical aspect, um, breaking my collarbone when I was in the grade 10, I believe it was, was a very momentum shift for me. I was on a, like, I was climbing high with the national team, getting opportunities like to touch foot into like a senior camp at the Pan Am games and stuff. And I just broke my collarbone a month and a half before that camp came up um, with the Pan Am games following in Toronto. Um, like, I think it was the next like six months later, I just couldn't make my recovery back in time. I had to get surgery and everything and having to kind of deal with that and realize that my opportunity in a sense was missed and lost because of a silly injury that probably should have been prevented um, bothered me so much. I, I couldn't, go to rehab. I was scared. I was never going to actually be able to play like myself again. And to have that momentum just be like cut off. And now you're just learning everything from the basics again, how to lift your hand. Um, my mom had to bathe me, like just kind of losing your womanhood in a sense as well was a very, like, it was humbling in a sense because now it brought me back to ground zero and it made me appreciate everything so much more. Um, and the opportunities that I had. So that, took turn onto a mental aspect because now I had to learn how to accept defeat, accept fault, um, and kind of persevere through that all. Um, it wasn't easy. I, I, it hurts. Like even to this day, I'm wondering, Oh, like, would I be better if I didn't break my collarbone? But you can't think like that. And I have to like, kind of like wipe that slate clean. Um, but those probably are the two major things in my life. I'm pretty fortunate. I haven't had any like drastic moments where like the world's come to an end i mean corona basically is coming to an end but like other than that nothing crazy right yeah okay that's great but uh, sorry for the the you know breaking the collarbone that must have been like real honestly <laughs> really devastating at that moment for you yeah. like how would you inspire other people or young children who actually go through something like that like maybe right before a game something happens or something major that they were going through and then an injury occurs i think I think at first you gotta just go with the emotions. Like you're gonna feel it, let the emotions come out. Um, I think one of the hardest things that I had like a hard time doing was showing how I felt and expressing that. Um, instead I tried to be brave and strong and told my parents I'm completely fine and I'm not a mess. Whereas I was I was struggling inside, like I mentally, physically, all the aspects of that. Like you go from a high of training every day to not even be able to like sleep at night. So that mm -hmm. was, one of those things of just being able to express what's going on, what's going through your mind, be honest with yourself and your peers and your parents and your family, because that's what they're there for. They're there to support you and help you through all that. Um, and setbacks are a positive thing, I think, mm. because you learn so much about yourself. Right. I learned a lot about myself mentally. I learned a lot about myself physically. And I learned how much more I needed to be on the pitch because I loved it so much. Like it kind of just hones you in on, like I said, like just appreciating the small things um and how much you actually love the game because i didn't i was just going through the motions and when you're taken out of those motions you realize that like i'm actually missing a part of my life and that's what i want to do um so i think it's just one of those things that you just got to respect it respect the injury take it absorb it express how you feel at first give it give yourself whatever amount of time you need whether it's a month three days five days a week whatever it may be and then kind of just bring yourself back to ground zero and say, okay, well how am i going to make this better how am i going to get better from this um and then from there just grow Great advice. That's powerful. Uh, that's really powerful in these times where we're in a global pandemic. People have had their lives, you know, derailed in some <laughs> aspects. That's a really good message. I feel like what you just said for your injury is applicable to a number of different aspects of life. So we appreciate you sharing that. No, and I think that's exactly what's gotten me through this pandemic because our whole lives have been kind of thrown to the side and everyone's kind of just confused what's going on, um, accepting this new form of normality. But because of the obstacles I faced in the past, the injuries, whatever, I think dealing with this pandemic has been a lot more 
in a sense, easier for me. And I think as an athlete, your whole life has just been put on pause. It's not like you can work from home in a sense. You know what I mean? Like you can't go for the competition anymore. You can't get the adrenaline rush that you always get every Sunday. Um, the training and the challenges you get on the environment. So having that being taken away from you and stripped down to nothing and basically become like a basic person, it, it was just really hard. But um, I can imagine how many people are struggling right now. But as things get back to normal, you can just kind of feel the adrenaline and the anticipation and the excitement of getting back to the pitch. Um, and this whole experience kind of just brings back um, why you do it and what's your why. Um, so I think that's really important. So Riley, we're going to play a little game. It's called, what would you rather? Okay, so there's a few, just a few questions, three to five questions. Okay. So what would you rather? Would you rather win the World Cup for Canada or the Champions League for winner, uh, Liverpool? Oh my God. Oh my That's tough. <laughs> um, I think I'd have to say, I want to win the World Cup for Canada first. Um, the country's been working so hard and to bring a World Cup home would just be mesmerizing mm -hmm. as much as i want to win the champions league on the women's side um i think it's good. i want to win the world cup first <laughs> <laughs> Great. so what would you rather listen to shania twain or the beatles before a pre-game match shania twain all the way <laughs> <laughs> but you're a little you have a favorite song <laughs> yeah, I, I i don't know like you know those songs just come on you know like mm. shania twain is that girl for me like growing up you just listen to her all the time Right. Okay, so what would you rather? McDonald's, Burger King, or A and W? And what would you order? Oh, she here's a problem. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> on, oh. your cheat day, on your cheat day. What beyond, would you do? beyond beef. Beyond A and W beef. has a bomb beyond beef burger I've heard. So I'd have to go for A and W because they also have root beer and every now and then I like a good root beer. See, and W, if you're watching, your new sponsor is right here, Riley yeah. Foster. <laughs> Riley Foster, hook her up. Send, send some good stuff out to the UK. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Riley, for being with us and have, taking the time to come and have the interview with us today. Thank you for having me, honestly. It was awesome talking to you guys. Excellent. And where can our audience find you on social media? Um, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, my name is pretty much the same. I think it's just underscore Riley Foster. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm open to all questions and answers. Like, if you want to talk, I'm here for you. <laughs> Fantastic. And we really appreciate your time today, Riley. We look forward to your success at Liverpool and also for Canada in the future. And yes. we hope to have you in studio when, when you're back in, in Ontario. Yes, for sure. I can't wait to get back. And I'd love to come see you guys and just kind of converse more and further this. Right. Yeah. So good luck in Liverpool where you are right now. Have fun. Hopefully you don't get drenched in the rain. <laughs> It's England. Right? <laughs> it's England. It's all good. Thank you <laughs> no, thank you for your time. And um, for our audience, this has been Toronto Talks for some more. For the love of the six, let's connect. Thank you for watching. Please click the like button and leave us a comment with your feedback. And don't forget to subscribe with notifications to see more engaging and interactive content. Toronto Talk Sports and more for the love of the six. Let's connect.